ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أيها الأحبة this afternoon we're going to take a quick look at one of the أحاديث of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم which we are always in need of in order to keep us going, if you will, in order to give us this incentive to continue on even though we have so many shortcomings and we are so weak. The hadith is narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu arda in which he says, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولُ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى يَبْنَ آدَمْ إِنَّكَ مَا دَعَوْتَنِي وَرَجَوْتَنِي إِلَّا غَفَرْتُ لَكَ يَبْنَ آدَمْ لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عِنَانَ السَّمَاءَ أَوْ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءَ ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرْتَنِي غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي يَبْنَ آدَمْ لو لقيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا للقيتك بقرابها مغفرة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام The basic meaning of this hadith and it is a hadith Qudsi by hadith Qudsi uh, what is meant because we have different forms of revelation I mean, there is the Quran and then you have what we call the Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and as far as the Sunnah is concerned, we have these ahadith which are reports of what the Prophet ﷺ said, for example. And from that, or from those reports, we will find that on occasion the Prophet ﷺ says, Qal Allah, that Allah has said. Well, we're familiar with that terminology when it comes to the Qur'an. The Qur'an being the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was brought to the Prophet ﷺ through the angel Jibreel. So now we have this hadith Qudsi, what we're referring to as the hadith Qudsi or some, you know, some of them loosely translated as a holy translation, uh, uh, narration. Uh, so what we're speaking of here is the Prophet is saying that Allah said except that these words that he is going to say now are not to be found in the Qur'an. They are not in the Qur'an. Now, there are different definitions given for hadith Qudsi. Perhaps the most uh, well-known definition is that it is this report or a, a narration and the meaning of what is being said is from Allah and the wording is from the Prophet wasallam. Some further say that, and that it was sent to the Prophet wasallam, or the manner in which it was revealed to him was either in a, in, in a dream because dreams of prophets are also forms of revelation. So it was either a dream or it was ilham. Some, he was inspired somehow by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he expressed what Allah is saying in his own words. But, and we say Allah knows best, it would appear that both the wording and the meaning is from Allah. And the manner in which it differs from the Qur'an or from those things which make it different from the Qur'an is that through reciting it, that is the Qur'an, we attain certain rewards. For every letter we have ten hasanat. But that is not the case with the hadith Qudsi. As for the Qur'an, 
then it has been preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will be preserved until the last day and anything that you find in the Quran is not open to debate. In other words, you cannot say what well, this ayah, did it come to us through authentic narrations or not? There's no such thing in the Quran. As for these ahadith which are known as hadith Qudsi, there are those which have been fabricated and alhamdulillah the, the scholars have identified uh, those, there are those which have weak narrations, those which have strong narrations and so forth. In any event, so this hadith that we are dealing with is called a hadith Qudsi. Anas says, radiallahu an, that I heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, qala Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala, Allah, the uh, exalted, said, Yabna Adam, O son of Adam, O children of Adam, إِنَّ كَمَا دَعَوْتَنِي وَرَجَوْتَنِي إِلَّا غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي The basic meaning here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that O children of Adam as long as you continue to supplicate me turn to me begging of me and having hope in me that is hoping that Allah will not forsaken you Hoping that Allah will forgive you when you ask for forgiveness. As long as you continue to do so, then whatever you have done, whatever sins that you may have committed, then I will forgive them for you and I will not mind. It will not be bothersome. Then he continues, Yabna Adam. لو بلغت ذنوبك عنان السماء ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك ولا أبالي. Then he says that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, even if your sins, if you could now think of the sins in in some tangible form, and they were to be stacked up, piled up, and they reached the clouds of the skies. If they reached the clouds of the sky, if they were that many in number, the sins. Then as long as you turn back and you beg of my forgiveness, then I shall forgive you and I shall not mind. And he continues, Yabna Adam Lawlaqitani Bi Qurabil Ardi Khataya. If you were to meet me with sins that were so many in number that they would practically fill the entire earth up. If your sweet sins were that many. ثُمَّ لَقِيتَنِي لَا تُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا With the condition that you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We're speaking of the hereafter now Without having committed shirk Without having set up partners with Allah Without having turned to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is, you know, again one of the uh, importances Of always turning to Allah and Allah alone and worshipping Allah and Allah alone. Not putting our faith in any human beings, no matter how righteous they may be. Not turning to even the Prophet ﷺ for help, but only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not turning to those fortune tellers and those who claim that they can you know, make your problems disappear by writing things in a certain way and having you hang them around your neck. So as long as you are one of those, who does not set up partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if we were to meet Allah on the day of Qiyamah not having set up any partners with Him even if our sins were so many in number then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَلَقِيتُكَ بِقُرَابِهَا مَغْفِرَةً Then I will meet you with forgiveness in a similar fashion so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us great glad tidings here this hadith is narrated or related by Al Imam At Tirmidhi, alayhi rahmatullah. And it is a name that probably uh, you've heard very often, At Tirmidhi. Now, we want to talk here a little bit, very little, on, on, on who he is, but more so on what his compilation of a hadith means to us. There are certain compilations of the hadith. We have Sahih al Bukhari, the authentic. Narrations by Al-Imam Al-Bukhari Rahimahullah Similarly, Sahih Muslim And then you hear of Al-Kutub Al-Sitta You hear of the, the six famous books of Hadith Amongst them, 
is Sunan at Tirmidhi. This compilation of an Imam at Tirmidhi, alayhi rahmatullah. And that compilation of a hadith is really part of our inheritance as an Ummah, it's part of our heritage. It is a gift that was presented to us by this great Imam, and which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved for us. You know, these books of hadith, whether it be Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim, or these uh, six famous books of, of hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected our religion for us through them, of course, through the Quran, and then through these, through these sources of Islamic knowledge. A great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, towards us. Now, these books are so important because had they been destroyed, then a great deal of our knowledge would have gone. And there were times when it was very possible for that to happen. I'm going to relate to you some incidents uh, where it could have been possible that we lost that we lost this knowledge. You all have heard of at Tatar, huh, the Mongols, uh, and, and their leader was uh, Genghis Khan. They attacked the Muslim world. They came from uh, Siberia, and they started to attack the Muslim lands. Now, one may ask. Because if you really look to, the, to our history, this was um, a very painful time. What happened to the Muslims is unimaginable. But we also have to understand why it happened to us. These types of things happen when the Muslims forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah didn't mean much to the Muslims, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed over them, that is the Muslims, He placed over them those who had no mercy in their hearts whatsoever. The Tatar, the Mongols, didn't know, didn't know mercy. And it is reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ لَمْ يَتَعَرَّفْ إِلَيَّ سَلَّطْتُ عَلَيْهِ مَنْ لَا يَعْرِفْنِي Basically what this means is whoever does not become familiar with me. In other words, if you don't remember Allah, if you're not keeping your duty to Allah, if people neglect their duties to Allah, in other words, our deen, al-Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in authority over such people, those who don't know Allah. If they don't know Allah, what does it mean? It means they're not going to have any mercy. They have no conscience whatsoever. And that was the case with the uh, Mongols or at Tatar. Uh, they were, yani, they were barbaric. They turned the masajid into stables for horses. This is the type of thing that they did. But at the same time, Subhanallah. I mean, and one of them would have stood on the mimbar in the masjid from where the khutbah of Jumu'ah is delivered and would drink alcohol in front of the Muslims and they could not uh, and they could not move and the Muslims at this point had lost any type of respect and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were worth so little because of their neglect towards their duties, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things had gotten so bad, and they feared the Tatar so much, that they would gather in the masjid, and one of the Mongols would come with a sword and kill all of them. As a matter of fact, it got to the point where one of those Mongols, the, the Tatar, would say to the people, hang on, stay where you are. I need to go and get my sword. So he would go, and the Muslim was re would remain sitting there, because they were so weak, and he would come back and kill them all. Or he would say to one of them, put your head on this stone. Not forcing him, not just telling him, put your head on the stone, and the Muslim would do it until he came with the sword, and he would slaughter him in front of everyone. This is the state the Ummah actually reached at one point. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was not going to allow the message of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come to an end. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah was meant for the world. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ It's a universal message and it still 
had to spread. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for the ummah to come back, to regain its strength. But it did not regain its strength through military might and that's it. This is not how the ummah will ever regain its strength. Many people think that in order for us to succeed, in order for us to be strong, we have to be economically strong. But you know that that's not true. Because if you look at the wealth in the world today, who's actually pumping money out of the earth? The oil reserves are, do you notice that they're mainly in the Muslim lands? So we have lots of money, but still we are weak. So it's not all about money. Yes, that has a role in things. But more important than that is that we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you see that the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for the Muslims to return and regain their honor and regain their strength and have power again, it happened when the Muslims returned to Allah. When the Muslims started taking their religion seriously again. You've all heard of Qutuz, the Sultan of the uh, Al-Mamalik. So, what happened with him is that he was captured when he was young and he was sold and resold and kept as a slave. Until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he became free and he also became a sultan. This was when he, uh, when he was in Egypt. He was able to gather the people upon La ilaha illallah. One day, he... I mean, and, and again, you have to understand, this is at a time when the Tatar were spreading all of that corruption. The people were so scared that even, you know how uh, you try to scare children? If they're doing something wrong? Even the mothers would scare their kids and say, watch out, otherwise one of those, you know, Mongols will come and get you. I'll give you up to one of those. They used to scare them with, with, with that sort of thing. In any event, uh, so he one day got up and he was addressing the people in the khutbah of Jumu'ah. And because he was so sincere in what he was saying, he shed tears and he cried. And the people were moved. And they were even more moved when at the end he said, Wa Islama. Oh, our Islam. In other words, what is happening to our Islam? We need to do something about this. It cannot continue this way. He was so worried that even when he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would turn to Allah saying something similar to what the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam used to say, and that is, Ya Allah, if this group of people is destroyed, then you will never be worshipped on the face of this earth again. This is how serious. Uh, this is how serious things were. So he was able to move the people, mobilize them, he encouraged them to stand up for their Islam, and alhamdulillah the people gathered. And they realized, what I just said a while ago, that your spiritual strength alone is not sufficient. They already knew that material strength is not sufficient. Spiritual strength alone is also not sufficient. They understood well, that they needed to be spiritually prepared, but they had to be prepared in other ways as a Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us in the Quran that as far as our opponents are concerned, we must prepare ourselves, we must become strong. So militarily we needed to be strong. Spiritually we need to be strong. Financially we need to be prepared and we need to be we need to be strong. Mentally we need to be prepared. We need also intellectually to be prepared. So alhamdulillah, all of these people gathered and realizing all of these things, everybody was willing to contribute. They even contributed from their wealth to the extent, to the extent that gold and silver was piled up. There was more than enough. So uh, Qutuz also allied himself with the ulama, with the scholars. <coughs> and they started to prepare the armies. Okay, they started to, to get their, their troops in shape. So they would train. They would train until Salat al-Maghrib. Until al-Maghrib. 
and Qutuz and the ulama, depending on, on where they were, they would go and inspect these troops. And the best thing of all is, they would train all day, and after Maghrib, there they were busy in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turning to Him uh, sincerely until Salat al Fajr. And we see that even with the Sahaba, uh, many of them would spend their nights in prayer. And if we, uh, if we look into our history, you will find many of the righteous who were part of armies. I mean, the, the commander of the army would be happy to see that particular individual, a particular individual in his army, because of the fact that he would stand in prayer at night. And he said, perhaps it is because of this person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us victory. The ulama or the scholars also advised Qutuz. They told him to do certain things. He said, listen, riba, or dealing with, with interest, you need to make certain that this is stopped. It is not done. As far as uh, alcohol is concerned, you have to prohibit it. There's no way it can it continue. So basically, they wanted, to, they wanted to put a stop to these major sins that people were involved in at the time. And alhamdulillah, uh, they responded. Qutuz responded, and he ordered the people, and he advised them, and they took his advice. And why did the ulama tell him this? Because, once again, the more we fall into disobedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more likely it is that those who are in authority over us will be worse than us. Or will be from amongst us. And this is why I remind myself and then all of you. It is very easy to speak against our rulers and our leaders. They are not angels. I'm with you. I'm, I, I agree 100% about how the rulers may be. But I ask myself and I ask all of you, why? It is because we deserve them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. So until we... إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us basically that He will not change our state and our condition until we change what is within ourselves. So once we turn things around ourselves, once the ummah is in a better situation, then of course we will get those ruling over us who, who are from amongst the righteous. But if we are as we are, then we will get who we deserve. عَلَى كُلِّ حال. So, this continued, and then he allied with Al-Iz ibn Abdi Salam. Al-Iz ibn Abdi Salam was one of the great Shafi'i scholars of the time. And what they did then was they told the people, because this was going to be an intense battle, one of the most intense battles that the Ummah has ever uh, witnessed. So they advised the people to fast for three days before the battle took place. And the battle began. The Muslims were fighting against the Tatar between Egypt and Asham, uh, the region of, of uh, greater Syria. And as I said, it was a very heated and a very intense battle. The son of Genghis Khan was uh, the head of the army and he as I said before, didn't know anything called Rahmah. Nothing. Mercy was not in his, in his dictionary. That army was so fierce that even historians thought that this is, this is one army that will never face defeat. This is how powerful that army happened to be. The battle began and the Muslims started to fall. The front line, down. I mean, the Muslims started to fall. The, the, the Tatar were, were overpowering them. And in the middle still was Qutuz, with whoever remained from his army. And when he saw all of this happening, it was almost as though he was losing hope. So he took off his helmet and he trampled on it. He put it on the ground and he trampled on it and he said, Wa Islama. Some of the historians say he actually said it silently, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Muslims to hear it. Again, when we say, Wa Islama, O oh my Islam, O oh our Islam. In other words, what is happening to it? We are losing it. 
when the Muslims heard that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that it, it moved them again. So all of a sudden, they came to and they regrouped and they started fighting fiercely and alhamdulillah, they were now victorious. But they were told, don't stop now. Keep at it. Keep fighting them until you get them close to Damascus. <coughs> and the, the fight carried on three days and three nights. Bodies all over the place. Many of them were captured. That is from the Tatar. Many of them were killed. And the historians write about how you know, there was a stench from the rotting bodies. That when the wind blew, people from far away could actually, could actually smell. Uh, those bodies that were that were rotting and this way uh, the Muslims were able to to defeat the Tatar now the the Tatar also for a while were in an area close to Damascus and after some time they tried to enter Damascus and there they met with that famous man Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah alayhi rahmatullah and that was around the time of Ramadan it was Ramadan and there was this impending enemy, this enemy coming towards them. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah stood and this is in the daytime of Ramadan and he drank in front of everyone and he broke his fast. This is a great scholar, yes, and he told them that listen, here I have broken my fast and you also have to break your fast. How can we remain fasting when we have this enemy that we need to face? And in order for them to win that battle, they, they needed to break their fast. And it's permissible, of course, in such situations. And he also delivered uh, a very emotional khutbah, or a sermon. You know, if somebody heard it, they would have thought that, you know, the hereafter is coming. And he said to them, that most certainly we are going to be victorious. He continued to say those words until people who were sitting in the front said, don't forget to say, Insha'Allah. And he said, I will say it. This is from the famous words that he said. I will say, Tahqiqan la ta'liqan. What does that mean in English? So he's saying, Insha'Allah, that by the will of Allah, we are going to defeat them. We are going to be victorious. He says, I'm going to say it in certainty, not out of mere hope. Because let's face it, when people say, Insha'Allah, I mean, today is worse than it was probably then, right? <laughs> so if somebody asks you to do something, and you say, Insha'Allah, then in their minds, they're like, okay, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I, I mean, say, Insha'Allah, okay, I, I understand. You don't want to do it, whatever. That's your, that's your excuse. That's, you know, you're a cop-out. The first time I really understood this is when I was a student in Medina. So... Uh, I had a lot of relatives and, and people that I got to know there because they would come from South Africa, you know, relatives that I didn't know before. Anyways, so they asked me something and I said, Inshallah, I will do it tomorrow. Or they said, hang on, is that like a real Inshallah or a Saudi Inshallah? I said, what? What's a Saudi Inshallah? They said, oh, like all the shopkeepers here, when we ask them for something, they tell us, tomorrow inshallah. So they took them by their word. They go back, the guy doesn't even recognize them. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? What do you want? Okay, so anyway, so he said, I'm saying it tahqiqan la ta'liqan. I'm saying it, you know, with certainty that inshallah, of course, everything is by the will of Allah. It's going to happen. Not just hoping that it is going to happen. That is a type of confidence that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala uh, had. So, Alhamdulillah, the Muslims were able to confront the Tatar and they were able, they were able to de defeat them. Again, coming back to why is it that we're talking about this? We're talking about it, you know, just as, as, as a history of uh, how these books were preserved for us. You see, the Tatar, when they entered Baghdad, one of the things they did is they took all the books that they could and they threw them in the river and they used them as a bridge. The horses would walk over those books. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected this legacy of ours. Sunan al-Tirmidhi is from those books that were protected. The historians say that alhamdulillah most of what was taken by them was just nonsense. Like not, not really valuable books. And Allah, because, you see the, 
the libraries, if you will, were filled by Al Ma'moon and, and those who, who were with him with, with these types of books on philosophy and this and that. But Alhamdulillah, the books of Tafsir, many of the books of Hadith and so on and so forth were, uh, were protected. So, Sunan al Tirmidhi is from those important books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved for this, for this Ummah. As far as Al Imam al Tirmidhi, Alayhi rahmatullahi ta'ala is concerned then he, yes, he was a simple man but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated his status and look at today how many hadith do you read in whether it be Riyadh al-Salihin or wherever else and you hear Rawahu al-Tirmidhi related by al-Tirmidhi and then he says هذا حديث حسن هذا حديث صحيح هذا حديث حسن صحيح then you hear that this Imam, this great Imam is saying that this is an authentic hadith and so on and so forth. Uh, At-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, as Al-Imam Al-Zahabi, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi uh, said, that he used to cry so much, he used to cry so much, that he became blind as a result of it. These are, you know, some pretty amazing things and facts that we, uh, that we hear about some of our great scholars. But coming back to the hadith, this hadith that is with us, <coughs> notice that in it we are being given hope. Because the way of the Muslim is not to give up hope. It's not to think that there's never any way out. No matter what level you reach, however low that level may be, where you think that you have, you know, you have lost everything, that you have committed so many sins, there are those who will say, I mean, I've been so bad that there's no way that Allah could ever forgive me for what I've done. There isn't a sin except that I've done it. And I've even done things that maybe Iblis, the shaitan, would be ashamed of. Yes, there are Muslims who are in that situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And it is not befitting for anyone to make things worse for us by telling us that yeah there is no hope for you because there always is hope and the way of the Prophet وسلم, was that whenever he sent scholars whenever he sent callers to Islam to different lands he would say to them Bashiru wala tunafiru yassiru wala tuassiru we say Bashiru Give people glad tidings. Give them hope. Don't chase them away. Don't scare them to the point that they feel that there's no way out for them. That, that, that there's, it's all doom and gloom in the future. Try to make things as easy as possible for them. Meaning, I mean, within the Sharia. When many people misunderstand or misinterpret this part of the hadith. Yassiru wa la tu'asiru. Make it easy, don't make it difficult. So, you know, certain things they say, go ahead and do it, it's easier. <coughs> not, not to make it easy while it contradicts the teachings of Islam. As long as it is within those boundaries laid down by Allah and His Messenger وسلم, then be easy with the people. If they want to do something, and as long as it's not haram, it's okay. Don't tell them they're compelled to do something that they don't have to do. And let me give you a simple example. Again, this is in the early days after I returned from al Madina and I started uh, you, you know, with my khutbahs and so on and so forth in, uh, in my community in, in Canada. I recall that I was speaking about the importance of Salah and how we should not leave the Salah and how it is our lifeline, if you will. At the end, before I left, uh, a sister came to me and she said, you know, I understand all of this, but I can't do it. I mean, I cannot do it because it's too difficult. And I said, what do you mean it's too difficult? She said, how can I, you know, at, at the end of the day, I have to pray Salah al Isha after a long day at work or studies, whatever it may be, and then I got to pray 17 rak'ah. I said, huh? She said, 17 rak'ah of Isha. And I said, really? I know of four, <laughs> right? But this is the problem, that some raise their children 
and they misinform them, making them think that, you know, I mean, if you add up all the nawafil and so on, maybe it adds up to that many. Because, you know, according to many of the Hanafis, there's four sunnah before Salat al Isha, and then there's the four faridha of Salat al Isha. So already you're up to eight. Okay, then they're talking about two sunnah. So you're up to how many? Ten. And then they talk about two from the nawafil. So they're talking now already of 12. And then they say there are three of the witr. That's already 15. And then they believe there's another two sunnah after the witr. So they bring it up to 17. Those who are familiar with, with people from the Indo uh, Pak subcontinent will know well what I'm saying. So they are raised to believe that 17, all or nothing. Well, if it's all or nothing in that sense, yeah, I mean, you know, you're talking about Salat al Isha coming in where we are in the summertime at 11 or after 11 p.m. It's not easy. 17 rak'ah. They said to her, listen sister, actually it's four. Four rak'ah that you must pray. And let me advise you to pray the witr along with it as well because the Prophet ﷺ never left it even when he was traveling. And the witr, yes, it's good to do three, but if you're really that tired you want to do one, it's okay. That was a lot more doable. بَشِّرُوا وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا يَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا Make it easy. Don't make it difficult for the people. Okay? So some of them misunderstand, as I said, and they will say, all right, you know what, it's too difficult to pray Isha because it's late. Go to sleep. Tomorrow, when you have time, you do qadha. You make it up. No, no, no. This is not, this is not from the understanding of the hadith. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ, this was his way. Can you imagine if Mu'adh ibn Jabal عنه, went to Yemen, he was going to a group of people from Ahlul Kitab, Christians for example, and he were to start with them, you know, by saying to them, listen, you had better listen, or Allah has this help prepared for you, and you... How would, how would the reaction of the people be? But rather he went with glad tidings. Bashiru wala tunafiru, as the Prophet wasallam always advised. And, you know, we hear of, of uh, incidents even in Al Jazair, in Algeria, um, you know, when the French had first entered and there was an Imam who gave this khutbah and he meant well, but what he did was he was trying to scare the people into doing good. And the opposite of what he wanted happened. So he went back and he was praying to Allah and so on and so forth until finally he realized that no, the way to, to, the way to actually move people and the way to, to sort of give them incentive and drive them towards good is by giving them hope. So when he went back another time, then he talked to them or he addressed them in a much better manner, giving them those ayat and those hadith of the Prophet ﷺ which give them hope. And Alhamdulillah, as a result of that, they were able to turn around and I think it was only about a year or so and they were able to kick out the French from their lands. There are those who wrote books thinking again that, you know, the people are in such bad shape so scaring them. With all of these verses of the Qur'an and these ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ warning of the hellfire and this and that and everything else. So what happened? The people started to leave the masjid. Because you thought, like, what good is there? I mean, look at it. It's all doom and gloom. It kind of reminds you of that man who killed a hundred people, right? Because after the 99th one, he goes to somebody and it happened to be a good person. It wasn't a bad person. That individual was an abid, a devout worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only he didn't have the proper knowledge. And so when he was asked, he told the guy, there's no hope for you. I mean, you killed 99 people. What hope can there be for you? There's no tawbah, there's no repenting. So he said, I may as well kill him as well. There's no hope, there's no hope. But because something was inside of him was saying that no, there must be hope. Uh, finally, when he asked a scholar, then that scholar told him, no, there is hope for you. But this is what you need to do. The bottom line again is that we are reminded through these many ahadith that we need to give people hope. You and I, if we had no hope, we would not. Uh, we will not continue. So, uh, <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ya ibn Adam, inna kama da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu laka ala ma kana minka wa la ubali. So, O son of Adam, 
uh, as long as you continue to turn to me in dua, supplication, and you have hope in me that I will forgive you, then I shall forgive you for whatever it is that you may have done, and I will not mind. Ponder over that. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing us. So from this, we should appreciate how kind and how gentle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is towards His slaves. Can you imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to punish us immediately for something wrong that we did? What would be our condition then? We would be in the worst of shape. As a matter of fact, some of the sins are so serious that we would be deserving of such punishment that would wipe us off the face of the earth. We also need to ponder because some of the people will look at this and they say, Okay, really? Allah is that kind and gentle towards us? What about those non-Muslims who are committing all sorts of crimes against Muslims? And you know that they're torturing Muslims and they're doing this. How come? Is Allah not seeing? Why does Allah not punish them? And some of the Mufassirin said something beautiful. They said, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well aware of what is happening. Of course, none of it happens without His permission. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people time. Perhaps some of them will return to Allah Azza wa Jal. Some of them will repent. As did, uh, you know, from the, uh, from the Tatar, many of them eventually became Muslim. One of them, one of the leaders, perhaps one of the sons of, of Genghis Khan, came to uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and he said, he was not even, not even a Muslim, and he says to him, pray for me. And the Imam made dua. He supplicated to Allah Azza wa Jal in Arabic, and this guy didn't even know what's being said. And he says, Ya Allah, if there's good in this person, he's not going to harm the Muslims and so on and so forth, then, then give him life. Let him live. But if there's evil in this person and he's going to harm Islam and the Muslims, then rid us of his, of his tyranny. And the man, not even knowing what he said, he would say, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Like a lot of us say in the masjid, right? We hear the imam, don't even know what he's saying. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Anyways, so he says, ameen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he became a Muslim. And many of the Tatar also, also became Muslim. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people time. And he's not unaware of what they do. Remember that he, tabaraka wa ta'ala, is just. And if their punishment does not come to them in this world, then it is most certainly going to come to them in the hereafter. So as I said, some of the Mufassirin, what did they say? They said, listen, why are you in a hurry? How long is this life? Let them be. 50, 60 years? And if they're not punished here, it means because those 50 and 60 years are not sufficient for punishment. They have thousands and thousands, they have eternity to be punished afterwards. So Allah Azza wa Jal is just and He will deal with them. So never lose, never lose hope when you, when you see these types of things, uh, when you see t these types of things as well. Tayyip. Uh, as far as, and we're, we're talking about going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, returning to Allah. What we're, we're talking about here is repentance. Remember that when we repent, before that, Whatever good we do, it is for ourselves. Allah does not benefit from anything that we do. So whatever good we do, we give money for the sake of Allah, yes, for the sake of Allah, meaning in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that Allah needs it from us, and not that Allah benefits from it. Whatever we do of good, it is for ourselves. Allah will reward us with good for what we do. It is for our spiritual upliftment and so on and so forth. It is that we ultimately will benefit in this world as well as in our graves, as well as in the hereafter, bi-ibnihi, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of the, 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 you know, the, the status that we have in Jannah. Remember that none of us will enter Jannah because of our deeds. We will only enter Jannah or paradise to begin with out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, what level you reach in Jannah, whether it be a higher level or, or not, that will depend on our deeds. Our deeds will, will determine where we, uh, where we end up in, in Jannah or in Paradise. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for these things. Similarly, when we disobey Allah, when we break the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is not harmed in the least bit. It is not harmful to Allah. 
Allah is not hurt by those things. He dislikes them, but He's not hurt by them. He's not damaged in any way by them. The ones who ultimately are harmed by those things is ourselves. This is why a shirk in a shirk la zulmun azim. Shirk is considered a great form of oppression. Not that you're oppressing Allah per se. No, you're actually oppressing yourself. It is a great injustice that you are not worshipping Allah and Allah alone. Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathira. As in the dua, we say, Oh Allah, I have wronged myself a great wrong. So when you sin and you disobey, yes, you're disobeying Allah, but you are actually harming yourself. We are not harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With all of that, you see, because Allah Azza wa Jal, He didn't create us so that He could punish us. This is not what Allah wants for us. Allah doesn't want to punish us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us to better ourselves so that He will forgive us so that we can enter into paradise. And therefore in that famous hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more pleased when one of us returns to him, when one of us repents to him wa ta'ala, then that individual who is out traveling in the middle of the desert and loses his riding animal with all his provisions and he looks for it and so on, he cannot find it. And finally he retires under a tree, that's it, he's doomed. He figures, I may as well pass my last little while here. He knows he's going to die. And all of a sudden, all of those provisions of his appear before him again. The camel finds its way back. And he becomes so happy that he says, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He says, oh, you are my slave and I am your Lord. Addressing Allah. He says it because he's so excited. You know, when sometimes you're excited, your words get you know, mixed up. Right? A slip of the tongue. So he says it and it's a slip of the tongue. He's, because he is just so excited. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even happier than that individual when one, when one of us returns to him, Jalla Shannu. And Ibn Mas'ud, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi says, Ayatun fi kitabillahi, wallahi ma uridu anna li dunya bima fiha bihadihi al ayah. Because the ulama spoke about many different verses in the Quran, which they said those verses are so wonderful that the, the most valuable things of, uh, on the face of this earth w would not replace them. So we would not have it. I mean, that ayah is more valuable to us than anything else. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu talks about one ayah. He says, I wouldn't want, I mean, if, if, if you would take away this ayah and in place of it give me this whole world and everything it contains, I wouldn't take that trade. That would not be uh, a good exchange for me. The ayah he is speaking of is the one in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna anhu nukaffir ankum sayyiatikum wa nudakhilkum mudakhalan karima meaning that if you avoid the sins which or the major sins which you are forbidden because we talked about major sins and minor sins before the major sins basically are those for which there is some threat in the Quran or the Sunnah that there is this punishment, either that punishment be in this world, the, the hudud for example, or it be a punishment that is going to come in the grave or the hereafter. Set punishments for example for certain crimes, those are com uh, considered to be major sins. Other ones are considered to be minor sins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what means, if you avoid the major sins which you are forbidden, we will remove from you your lesser sins and admit you, uh, and admit you to a noble uh, entrance, that is, you will be admitted into paradise. So basically, and some of the ulama or some of the scholars took from this, that if you avoid the major sins, then automatically Allah will forgive you your minor sins. If you understand the ayah, you will see why Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu wa ardahu is saying such a thing. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, if He did not grant us this, then what hope do we have? Look at the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us. Do your utmost. Stay away from those major things and your minor ones I will take care of for you. When we talk about 
keeping hope in Allah Azza wa Jal. Of course, there is the famous ayah, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Basically, the, the meaning of the ayah in Surah Al-Zumar, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ O you who have transgressed against yourselves, you have wronged yourselves, أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ that you have committed sins, and these are crimes that you have committed against Allah, but they are harmful to you. Ya ibadi alladhina asrafu ala anfusim, transgress against yourselves. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Subhanallah. Even though you have wronged yourselves, but never give up hope in the mercy of Allah. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Inna Allah yaghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a. For indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Because He is most certainly uh, the most forgiving and the most, uh, the most merciful. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Tayyib. As well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hope when we look to the, uh, again when we look to the Qur'an. Uh, he tells us, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يُسِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ أُولَئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ The quick meaning of that ayah and those who when they commit an immorality or they wrong themselves, they remember Allah and they seek forgiveness for their sins. And then we are reminded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who forgives sins other than Allah? Who forgives sins other than Allah? It's a rhetorical question, of course. It means that none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives sins. And who do not persist in what they do while they know. What is it? What is in there? What is what is in it for those people who turn to Allah Azza wa Jal, begging of His forgiveness? Those, their reward is forgiveness from their Lord and gardens beneath which rivers flow. That is in paradise, wherein they will abide eternally. And excellent is the reward of the righteous workers. Bashiru wala tunafiru. Give glad tidings, and do not chase people away. You know that in Bani Israel, uh, more than one prophet would exist at different times. So, you may have had certain times when there were two, three, ten prophets even. And it so happens that two cousins, Yahya and Isa alayhim as -salam, they were prophets at the same time to Bani Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed to Yahya alayhi salam that there are five things he needed to do. He was commanded with five things. And he was to order his people to adhere to those five things as well. But he delayed and he did not deliver that message. Until Isa alayhi salam, his cousin came to him and he said that, Oh Yahya, Allah has commanded you to convey this message to the people but you have not done so yet. So either you will do it or I will do it. Upon which Yahya alayhi salam said, Okay, I will do it. Otherwise I fear what will come to me from Allah Azza wa Jal. And so he gathered the people in the masjid and he conveyed the message. It is said afterwards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Isa alayhi salam that your method is better than that of Yahya alayhi salam. Why? Because Yahya alayhi salam, it is reported that he didn't smile. Because he feared the hereafter so much, he was always, you know, serious. But Isa alayhi salam, whenever he came across people, he would smile. Bashiru wala tunafiru. Similar is the case with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jarir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu anhu says, مَا رَآنِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِلَّا تَبَسَّمَ فِي وَجْهِ He says, never did I pass by the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم except that he smiled in my face. This is from the sunnah of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. Giving glad tidings in every way, not to make people feel miserable and so on and so forth in every way. Even that smile, imagine what an impact it has on people. If somebody is always addressing you and they're looking serious, 
Again, like I said, it's all about doom and gloom. People need to have that hope. People need to, to look forward to something. So this was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And just as an aside, you know, the Prophet ﷺ behaved with people in such a way that in a particular gathering, perhaps most, if not all of them, would think that, you know what, he probably loves me more than anybody sitting here. To that extent. And one of them, actually, was so confident that when they were sitting in a gathering, he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the most beloved of people to you? Of course, his quick response was Aisha radiallahu anha. And that's the first disappointment, because he thought it was him. Because when he used to sit with them, he used to take each one of them seriously. Whenever he looked at someone, he looked at them smiling at them. He looked at them with love and compassion. So they all felt he must be you know, uh, everyone thought that, 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 that he or she was the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. Then he said, okay, who's next? He figured, okay, all right, his wife, of course. Who's next? He says, uh, her father. Again, he thought it was him. <laughs> of course, he had to stop because uh, his name just wasn't coming up. But the Prophet ﷺ, his way was to make people feel good. Not that we don't talk about... Uh, you know, the punishment and so on and so forth. No, this is something that has to be done. There's no, uh, there's no doubt about that as well. But we need to keep that positive uh, part of things alive. Uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, alayhi rahmatullah, this is what the ulama said about him. Uh, they said that we would never meet him during the day except that he was smiling and laughing. Muhammad ibn Sirin, one of the great scholars. Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, whenever they would see him during the daytime, he'd never pass by him except that he smiled at you or he was laughing. But at night, when he was behind closed doors, even his neighbors could hear him crying when he stood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad ibn Sirin, that simple man that he may have been, he was a merchant. He used to sell oil. So at one time, he got many jars of oil, right? And he's trading in oil. And it so happens that a rat fell, fell into one of them. And he didn't know which one it was. The worth of those oils, a hundred thousand dirhams. So what did he do? He started having all the oil poured out. And he, they're like, it only fell into one. The rat fell into one of these jars of oil and you're pouring all of this oil out a hundred thousand dirhams worth. How come? He says, it fell into one. I don't know which one it is. And how can I now guarantee that the other ones were not contaminated before it fell into where it did? And that's why he was known as the Tajir Al-Amin. Ah, he was the, the trustworthy merchant. And here also another lesson that we want to take from people such as Muhammad ibn Sirin alayhi rahmatullah is that people should not think that ibadah, ibadah is restricted to the prayers and the siyam uh, we never ever uh, belittle those forms of, of worship you know dua, hajj, zakat, all of these things are forms of ibadah but don't think that your only way to jannah is through them of course that which is obligatory you have to do but remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, expects honesty from us. So if you were, I mean, there, there are people like merchants, people who are wealthy, alhamdulillah for them, maybe the, the gate through which they will enter Jannah is the gate of Sadaqah. Maybe. Because remember that there are different gates. There's Bab uh, al-Rayyan for the people who fast. There's the, the door uh, or the gate through which the Mujahideen will enter. So ibadah, Worship again is something which is which is very vast, and we need to make sure that we understand it. Lo balagat dhunubu anan al sama. So here again, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying that if your sins were piled up and they reached the clouds of the sky, anan or ilan al sama refers to the clouds, and there is a, a hadith in which the Prophet alaihi salatu wasallam speaks of this. So if your sins were that many in number, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He would still forgive you as long as you turn to Him with istighfar. Huh? Begging of His 
begging of his uh, forgiveness. Tayyib. And here, we need to look at other ahadith that of course support this particular hadith. Ahadith which are there for our benefit. To give us glad tidings. To give us encouragement to continue. Because honestly, let's face it. If one of us were to read the Quran properly and understand it. If we were to read certain ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which we are commanded to do certain things. And we tried to judge ourselves. What would happen if we didn't have other ahadith to, to console us? We could take things so seriously that we'll say, wow, we are doomed. And if we try to compare ourselves with the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi Ta'ala alayhim ajma'een, also we would say that we are doomed. Let's face it, do we pray anywhere near what the Sahaba used to pray? And yet they used to fear the punishment of the hellfire. The Sahaba, Abu Bakr is Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, the best of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fear being tossed into the hellfire. If that was his case, what about me and what about you? So there's a lot that could, you know, lead us towards perhaps giving up, uh, giving up hope. But we want to now uh, look at some ahadith which are similar to this one, which give us, which give us hope. Remember, كل بني آدم خطاء وخير الخطائين التوابون. All of us, without exception, are prone to err. We're bound to make mistakes. But the best of those who make mistakes, as the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said, are those who Repent and turn back to Allah Azza wa Jal. The first hadith I'd like to share with you is reported by Abu Bakr in Siddiq radiallahu anhu wa arda. Tayyib. He tells us what he heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Ali radiallahu anhu heard it from him. I want to tell you a little story about Ali radiallahu anhu. Many people would come to him with different hadith. Oh, I heard this from the Prophet ﷺ. This came from the Prophet ﷺ. Before accepting a hadith, do you know what he used to do? We're talking about Ali radiallahu anhu. He would ask them to swear by Allah. Not that he didn't trust them, but to make them understand how serious this is. So what you're saying, are you sure? I mean, you're, you swear by Allah. This is exactly what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And once they said, I swear by Allah. If this is what Allah said, uh, then he would accept and he would act upon what he heard. Ali radiallahu an. So, Ali radiallahu an, here is from whom? Here is from Abu Bakr al Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda. And Abu Bakr al Siddiq is, of course, the best of this ummah after the Prophet. The hadith goes as such. سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولُ مَنْ أَلَمَّ بِذَنْبٍ يعني أصاب ذنبا فتوضأ وصلى ركعتين ثم استغفر الله من ذاك الذنب إلا غفر الله له The hadith is reported by Imam Ahmad and inshaAllah ta'ala it is an authentic hadith as it was report, uh, or, or um, as said by the majority of the scholars of hadith. طيب. So the hadith in it, we're being told that whoever commits a sin, whoever commits a sin, and thereafter purifies themselves through the wudu, in other words, you go and you, you take ablution, then prays two rak'ah. You pray two rak'ah. And thereafter you beg of Allah's forgiveness for that sin that you committed. Then Allah will forgive that person for the sin. Did we get the hadith? Anyone who sins and then takes wudu and prays two rak'ah and does istighfar, begging of Allah's forgiveness, then Allah will forgive them for that sin, insha'Allah ta'ala. Of course, it would depend on the sincerity of that individual. Some people call this salat al-tawbah. Call it what you like. This is the hadith. I mean, we don't have a terminology for it, but if this is what some people like to call it, it's okay. So, and it doesn't matter whether it's a minor sin or a major sin. All sins. If you commit a particular sin and you do this, then inshaAllah ta'ala, your sin shall be forgiven. We're speaking still of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda. There's a hadith in the Sahihain, in Bukhari and Muslim. And I hope we, we will memorize this dua because it is... Recommended that we say it, for example, in our 
tashahud. In the last rakah of the salah, before you do the salam, there's some dua to be recited. This is one of the dua that you can recite. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda says, Ya Rasulullah, Allimni dua'an ad'u Allah azza wa jalla bihi fi salati. Teach me a, a, a dua, a supplication that I can say in my prayer. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded to him. And you know, whenever we hear the name of a sahabi, although it's not wajib, it's not fard, compulsory for us to say radiallahu an or radiallahu anha for a female sahabiya, uh, although it's not compulsory, but why should we not beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with them? When he made them a means of so much good for us. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu an asking the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. This dua, we would not have known it if the sahaba didn't ask. Said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me this dua. Radiallahu anhu arda. May Allah be pleased with him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the, the highest that was in Jannah for this ilm, this knowledge, and this rahmah, this mercy that came to us uh, because of him. Tayyib. So he says to him, Say, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathiran wa la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta faghfirli warhamni innaka anta alghafurur rahim. I repeat the dua. He says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu say Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathiran wa la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta faghfirli warhamni innaka anta Al-Ghafurur Rahim. The meaning of the dua, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathiran. O oh Allah, I have indeed wronged myself zulman kathiran a great deal. I've done a great injustice towards myself. And there is a riwaya or a narration that says, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kabiran. Kathiran or kabiran. Both of them. You don't need to combine. Zulman kathiran wa kabiran. Although an Imam al-Nawawi Alayhi rahmatullah did mention somewhere that you can combine between the two of them. And that was because he wanted to make sure that the, the, the narrations would all be preserved. But the reality is that they're two separate narrations. So either you say dhulman kathiran or dhulman kabiran. Both of them are correct. You can sometimes say this and sometimes say that. Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathiran or dhulman kabiran. Oh Allah, I have wronged myself. A great deal. The, the, the general meaning. وَلَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ And none forgives sins other than you. Remember that we are Muslims. We don't believe that somebody else can, you know, tell us that, Oh, you're my son, your sins have been forgiven. We don't go and confess our sins to anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that in the church they have, where they go to the priest and they have confession. They spill their guts. This is what I've done. That, you know, I've done this. I've done that. And finally, you know, he gives them. Oh, okay, it's all written off for you. Like, who is this human being that has the authority to say that Allah has forgiven your sins? No, they have no authority whatsoever. It is Allah and Allah alone who forgives sins. And they don't have any revelation coming to them that they can say, "Oh yes, God has forgiven you." No one has that authority. And for us, if we commit a sin. It is not recommended ever to talk about it with others. Rather, what is recommended, what is an obligation, is that you keep it between yourself and Allah. As long as Allah has concealed that sin for you, then be grateful, be thankful. Keep it between you and Allah so that you can ask for forgiveness from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ta'ibu min kaman la dhambala. Remember that the one who repents from a sin is like one who has not sinned. If your repentance is accepted, it is wiped off your slate as though it never happened. But, there's a problem. And that is that there are those who like to brag about their sins. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, everybody will enter Jannah except a certain category of people. And they ask, who are they? And he said, وسلم, those who sin by night, for example, and Allah conceals their sin. Nobody knows about it. But the next day they go and start bragging to their friends about it. Oh, last night I did such and such. I did this and I did that. Okay? So, again, we conceal our sins. Allahumma, inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathiran 
wala yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta faghfir li warhamni innaka antal ghafurur rahim so forgive me and have mercy on me for indeed you are the one who is most uh, most forgiving and most merciful and abu bakr radiyallahu anhu arda of course used to uh, used to say this dua repeatedly although he is that man who gave all his wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for when he came and he donated he gave this uh, wealth and property to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he wanted to know and what did you leave behind for your family? Here's, you know, that's a lot of wealth he says oh I left behind for them Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in other words everything I own I have given for the sake of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala this was Abu Bakr now, there are some people we may say to them, MashaAllah, you know, because you might, nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect. There are people, MashaAllah, who do a great deal of good. And we're close to them and we may know something of them and we try to advise them sometimes that MashaAllah, continue, you know, you're doing very well. And, and inshaAllah ta'ala, you'll continue to remember Allah a great deal and may Allah forgive you. Oh, they get offended. You make dua for them that may Allah forgive you and they're like offended. What do you mean? What do you mean try your best? You know how many times I've gone for Hajj? Dude, every, every year I go for Umrah. You know, I'm given Sadaqah, I fast, I pray. Look at the people out there, they're not even praying. Ya Subhanallah. We get uh, self-deluded. We become conceited. No. This is Abu Bakr and Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda. We can't come anywhere near that. And yet he had the sense to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda who was so emotional when he recited the Qur'an that people could not understand what he was saying. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ became very ill and he was not able to go out and lead the people in prayer, he said, Muru Aba Bakrin. Get, get Abu Bakr to lead you in prayer. Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ and the daughter of Abu Bakr said, uh, choose somebody else. Can you believe that? She says, choose somebody else other than my father, other than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda. Do you know why? Because he cries too much. Nobody will understand what he is saying. Ya subhanallah. And this man repeated this dua so often and there are those today who if we try to tell them to say this dua, they will become, they will become offended. Another, because he said, if your sins were to reach the clouds of the sky and you were to turn to me begging of my forgiveness. Yes, we can ask for forgiveness in any words and in any language. But as long as we have some of these supplications that were said by the Prophet ﷺ, then it is good for us to say them as well. So learn them. اللهم إني ظلمت نفسي ظلما كثيرا ولا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت فاغفر لي وارحمني إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم في صلاتي he said I want to say it in my salah so try to say this in your salah in your تشهد before you say the salam for example طيب another dua that no Muslim should not learn it is known as سيد الاستغفار in other words the best supplication through which you can seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Shaddad ibn Aws, radiyallahu anhu Allah says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidul Istighfar. The name Sayyidul Istighfar comes from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaddad ibn Aws, radiyallahu anhu says, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said, Sayyidul Istighfar. Sayyid, like the master, the leader. In other words, the best form of asking Allah's forgiveness is to say and taqul al-abd and yaqul al-abd for the for the servant to say Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant oh Allah you are my lord there is no god besides you tayyib khalaqatani wa ana abduk خَلَقَتَنِي وَأَنَا عَبْدُكَ You created me and I am your slave. And don't be afraid of using the word slave. Something, oh, it's you know, softer to use the word servant. Yeah, but I am a slave. Not to my wealth, not to my desires, not a slave to any human being. 
or any created being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that slavery we take pride in because Allah is my master anyways Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqatani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika mastata'at here you're saying that uh, I'm, I'm following your covenant and trying to keep my promise to you as much as possible, as much as I can. Right? That we worship none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do everything that we can please Him. Taib. Then he continues teaching us that dua. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at. I seek refuge in you from the evil that I have done. Then he continues, Abu ulaka bi ni'matika alayya wa abu bi dhambi. So basically, here we are saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Here I am before you, and I acknowledge all of your blessings that you have bestowed upon me. And I also confess all my sins and my wrongdoings. As I said to you before, we confess our sins only before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu'u laka bi ni'matika alayya wa abu'u bi dhambi faghfir li. So forgive me. Fa'innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta. For indeed, none forgive sins other, other than you. This is, uh, this is the dua known as Sayyidul Istighfar and one that every one of us should learn and repeat. Because we are in need of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, and His forgiveness. Tayyib. As we said, the reality is, the reality, not the dream world that many of us are living in, the reality is that we have great shortcomings. And had we not had this hope, we would be doomed. Do you know that it is reported in the Hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ajaban. Laka ya ibn Adam How strange your affair is O children of Adam Ma ansaftani Ya ibn Adam, O son of Adam You have not been fair to me This is Allah speaking to us Khalaqtuka wa ta'budu ghayri I created you and you worship other than me How many people think that they're worshipping Allah But in reality they end up worshipping their desires because there are those who claim La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah But when it comes to certain rulings in the Sharia That don't suit them They will look for any opinion That will match their desires Has that person truly worshipped Allah? Because remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Talked about the Christians and the Jews And how they took their rabbis and their priests As gods other than Allah uh, you know, uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu was told by one of them, but Ya Rasulullah, we never w used to worship our priests, we never used to worship our rabbis. He said, no, their worship of their rabbis, their worship of their priests was that when they made something halal, lawful, that is haram, that is unlawful, you followed them. Correct? We know that riba is haram, but we have a fatwa so we say it's halal. We know certain things are wrong. We know it. We know it because we read it, but because, oh, we heard that somebody says it's okay, we run after that. We know. But yet we're going to go after these opinions just to suit our own needs. So this is something very important that we need to look at as well. خَلَقْتُكَ وَتَعْبُدُ غَيْرِ I mean, look at humankind. Most people are not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have all these religions out there. وَرَزَقْتُكَ وَتَشْكُرُوا سِوَايَا I, I you know, grant you sustenance and you thank other than me. Some are just thanking themselves, thinking that everything is because of their, you know, their own, what their own hands have earned. أَتَحَبَّبُ إِلَيْكَ بِالنِّعَمِ وَأَنَا غَنِيٌ عَنْكَ I mean, I, I bless you with all sorts of gifts and favors. And... I have no need for you. I'm coming close to you by giving you all of these things. And what do you do in return? Here I am, I grant you all these gifts, and I don't need you at all. 
that I grant you these things so that you will love me. But then you try or, or uh, you do the opposite. How? You do the opposite by disobeying me. And you are the one in need of me. This is Allah Azza wa Jal saying it. Khayri ilayka nazil. Good is descending from me towards you all the time. Wa sharruka ilayya sa'id. And evil from you continues uh, to be sent upwards towards me. Uh, so then, as Muslims, we need to have that balanced, that balanced look. We have to realize that yes, we have shortcomings and so on and so forth. Now, because we're speaking about hope and we're speaking about fear and so forth, listen, I don't want people to get the wrong idea as well. I don't want that we go around and say uh, that, you know, everything is peachy keen and hunky-dory. There's no, no problems at all. Everybody's in the best possible condition. Alhamdulillah, we're eating and we're drinking. I mean, that's not what it's about. But you have to be, you have to be balanced. Yes, we find faults, but we have to look for solutions as well. We see wrong, uh, we don't turn a blind eye. No, we have to try and correct it in the best possible way. And the way to react to the evil that we see is not by talking ill of people. People see, many people, and perhaps it's a sickness, they take pleasure in speaking about other people's wrongs. Oh, did you hear last night it came on the news or I heard from so and so that you know this guy's son did this and he did that. He was caught red-handed in the act. Talking about specific people and the wrong that they have committed. Or looking at a particular group of people. A particular country, for example, now. Oh, you know, people in that, th those, uh, whatever group of people. Huh? There's, there's no hope for them. These people are like this. These, pe these people are like that. If they continue that way, you know what's going to become of them? No. Because the Prophet ﷺ warned against that. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man qala qad halaka nas fahuwa ahlakahum wa fi riwaya fahuwa ahlakuhum The meaning, and I want that we, we understand this part as well, very well. Because we do have a tendency of writing people off and writing nations off. Never write anyone off. It doesn't matter in our eyes how evil a person may look. They still have a chance. And for all the evil you see, you don't know what good is behind them. And you're going to hear in just a few moments a couple examples, uh, a couple quick examples from the Sunnah of that. Tayyib. Man qala qad halakan nas. Whoever says, ah, oh, that's it. That's the end of these people. Fahuwa ahlakahum. This particular narration says, fahuwa ahlakahum means that because of his speech, because of the way and his, uh, his speaking and his attitude, he's the one that destroyed them. Can you imagine if you keep speaking negatively to a people? Oh, you guys are good for nothing, you're like this. In the end, who's, who's the reason behind them uh, you know, being destroyed? It is that person who keeps looking down on them. Instead of helping them, instead of being a part of the solution, he's making the problem worse. فَهُوَ أَهْلَكَهُمْ and in another narration, فَهُوَ أَهْلَكُهُمْ Meaning, he is the worst of them. What he's doing is even worse than, than, than what they have done. So one needs to be very, very cautious when it comes, uh, when it comes to these types of things. As I said, we're going to look at uh, a few quick examples. We talked about istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those of us who may still not be convinced because, وَالْعِيَادُ billah, we are deceived into thinking that we've done so much good. I mean, really, what, why, why do I have to keep asking of Allah's forgiveness? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً This is the Messenger of Allah, the best of creation. The one who used to receive the revelation from above the seven heavens himself. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi saying, he used to say that I, seek forgiveness from Allah and I turn to Him in repentance more than 70 times in a day. Ya ayyuhal nas, tubu ila Allahi wa astaghfiruh fa inni astaghfirullaha akthara min mi'ati marrah. Another narration, he said, people, you, you need to repent, you need to beg of Allah's forgiveness. I do it more than a hundred times in a day. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu Allah says, in one gathering, 
He's not talking about the entire day. He says in one gathering, we would sit with the Prophet ﷺ and we would have counted that in that gathering, before we parted company, he would have said, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي That, oh Allah, forgive me. وَتُبْ عَلَيَّ And accept my repentance. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابِ uh, Ar-Rahim, indeed you are the one who accepts repentance and, and, and you are the most merciful, said we would have counted that he said it 70 times or more in one sitting, in one gathering alone. That was the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The examples I was speaking of, we know that there is something in our Sharia known as the Hudud. The Hudud being certain prescribed laws. I mean, this is in a purely Islamic state. I mean, these are these these are laws. These are prescribed punishments that need to be meted out, that need to be carried out, to purify people of their sins and to deter others from committing those sins. No one should think that by these laws being in place, that sins will never occur. That's not going to happen. Human nature is that we will sin. Okay, but how do we minimize it? How do we train the people? How do we correct the, the path of the people? Those who have fallen into those sins, how can they be purified? It is through these, through these hudud. As I said earlier, people like to speak of the wrongs of others. And they will condemn them. Not realizing what, what is behind those people. You know, there was a Sahabi, there were those who used to be brought before the Prophet ﷺ who used to drink alcohol and they used to be punished. Okay? And if anybody cursed them, okay, uh, for, uh, I'll give you an example here. So one of the Sahaba who used to drink on a regular basis, he used to be brought to the, he was brought to the Prophet ﷺ and, uh, and he, would be, he would be punished. Okay? One of them said, one of the Sahaba said to the one who was drinking, أَخْزَاكَ اللَّهِ مَا أَكْثَرَ مَا يُؤْتَى بِكَ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, may Allah disgrace you. May Allah humiliate you. He's praying against him. Look at how often you have to be brought before the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. I mean, just think about it. Somebody drinks so often and they have to keep being brought and that too in front of the Prophet ﷺ what do you think the response of the Prophet ﷺ was? Ameen, oh Allah, yes you know, disgrace this individual? No listen to what he said he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la taqul dhalik don't say that la tu'in shaytan ala akhik don't assist the shaytan against your brother because the more you insult someone, the more you uh, try to disgrace them, the more shaitan will go to them and say, yeah, I mean, you know, if this is how they think about me. If there's no hope for me, then they will continue in their ways. Don't assist the shaitan against your brother. Then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to show how our perception sometimes can be so wrong. Because something did, somebody did something so bad, we all of a sudden put an X on them and we write them off forever. But no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ He says, for indeed I swear by Allah, مَا عَلِمْتُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ I'm not aware except that this man loves Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So sinners can still have that love for Allah and love for his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in their hearts. Yes, they slipped up. They did something wrong. They committed that sin. But does it mean that you can just doom them to hell? You don't know what's going on. Look at uh, Al Ghamidiyah. This woman who came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she was pregnant. She said, "Purify me." Purify me meant stoning her to death. Purify me because. I committed adultery. The Prophet ﷺ tried to ignore her. So, you know, sort of turned away from her. So she went to the other side, so, see, but he turned the other way. A few times to find, he said, You want to do with me what you did with Ma'iz? It was another Sahabi 
who insisted that he needed to be purified of his sin. And the Prophet ﷺ tried to avert punishment. I mean, as long as he knew that the person is, uh, you know, feeling remorse and is repenting to Allah, there's no, then I don't want to punish you. See, this is not, this is not the view that others have. Outsiders think that we, we love blood. We want to stone people to death. We want to chop off hands. We want to execute people. No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, are you sure you're not crazy? And maybe he has a condition. No, no. Sound. Everybody attests that the man is sound of mind. Like, oh, maybe he's drunk. Trying to find some excuse not to punish him. So they went and they smelled his breath. Oh, he's not drunk. Right? Trying to find excuse. Until finally he said, that's it. Okay. And he insisted, I need to be purified. I want you to carry the punishment out on me. And then they punished him. They started stoning him. And some of the blood splattered onto Khalid ibn al-Walid. Oh, no, no, we're coming to the Ghamidiyah. So she said, do you, want, do you want to do with me what you did with Ma'iz? Radiallahu an. So she insisted. He said, okay. Because you're pregnant, go and come back once you've given birth. So she comes back. Oh, wow. He was hoping. <laughs> okay, she'll forget about it. After seeing that, you know, she has this baby in her hand, uh, she won't go back. So he's hoping that she will not come back. But she comes back with the child. Here's the child, you need to purify me. But he said, no, you have to go. And you know, the right of the child is that it, that it is breastfed. So breastfeed that child, and then you can come back after that. Two years later, she comes back. She still, look at the Iman. When, she, when she's saying, purify me, she's saying, stone me to death. She comes back. And the Prophet ﷺ, tries, you know, he tried whatever he could to avert punishing her, to avert carrying out that punishment. But she comes back and to prove that she has weaned the child off, because maybe the next excuse is go until he's completely weaned off, comes while the child is holding a piece of bread in his hand. Ah, now he can eat. He doesn't need my milk anymore. Weaned off completely. So then one of the Sahaba uh, took that child. Uh, I mean, today's terminology would be, you know, to adopt the child, but took the child under his wing, so he would raise that child. And, uh, and, and the Sahaba went, and they dug a hole, and they put her in it, and, and, and they started stoning her to death. I mean, this is not a shot to the head, and she would fall dead. This is not, you know, the sword with which they slice off her head. We're talking about a slow and painful death. Pebbles stones being thrown at her. She knew that this is what would be in store for her. So as they were doing so, some blood splattered onto the clothing of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu wa arda. And at that time, he prayed against her. Huh? So he said, uh, you know, he, he said something that was not, uh, that was not beco becoming. He spoke against her. And upon hearing that, the Prophet ﷺ said, Mahlan ya Khalid, take it easy, O Khalid. لَقَدْ تَابَتْ تَوْبَةً لَوْ وُزِّعَتْ عَلَى سَبْعِينَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ لَوَسِعَتْهُمْ Watch what you say. Because she has repented so sincerely that if it were, that, that it would suffice 70 people from the inhabitants of Medina. This is how sincere her repentance was. فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهَا تَتَغَمَّسُ فِي أَنْهَارِ الْجَنَّةِ He also said, after warning in that way, he said, you know, I saw, that is, Allah Azza wa gave him a vision of her enjoying herself in the rivers of paradise. So we have no right to write people off, to, to say that they are doomed in any way, uh, shape or form. Then you all know about the, the story of that man from Bani Israel. He was a mu'min, he was a believer. Okay? And so when he was about to die, he asked his children, what kind of a father have I been? Oh, you've been a wonderful father. Uh, but he knew otherwise. You know, the reason, the, 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 when we look at this hadith, there are many things to look at. The kids say you've been the best of fathers. Right? There are people, subhanAllah, they do things for everyone. 
they're kind. If somebody asks for help, I mean, you know, they would practically give them their blood, give them whatever to help people. But subhanAllah, when they are in private and nobody sees them, what happens between them and Allah? Only Allah knows. How much they disobey Allah behind closed doors? Only Allah knows. So he realized that yes, his kids were pleased with him because he did whatever he could for them. They saw him as a good role model, he treated everybody well. But he knew between him and Allah he committed many, many sins. And he was overcome with fear. So he said to them, when I die, I want you to burn me. To burn my body. Ignite a fire, toss me into it, cremate me. And you know, once I've been burnt to a crisp, pound what my remains, make them into dust. And then wait, not for any day, but wait for a day when it is very windy. And then throw my, throw my ashes. So they will be spread all over. Because he's thinking maybe that's a way that I can flee from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kun, be. And what happens? All of a sudden he's a man standing before Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And Allah asks him, what led you to that? What made you uh, tell your children to do that with your body? And he said that I feared your punishment because, you know, of my sins. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course knows what is in the hearts. Yes, the man, uh, you know, he didn't really doubt that Allah azza wa could bring him back. It's not that, but it's just when you, sometimes you're in that uh, great state of fear, subhanAllah, anything, anything can happen. You could, you could think wrong. So the man was thinking a different way. Maybe, just maybe I can, I can get away from the punishment of Allah. But because he did feel such remorse and such regret for what he did between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says to the angels, Ya malaikati ushidukum anni qad ghafartula. I place you as witnesses that I have forgiven, forgiven this individual. So then who are we then to come and uh, to tell people that, uh, that, they, are, that they are doomed? Tayyip. As I said, there are many examples and um, I may be able to just give another one or two before, before, we, uh, before we part company. Tayyip. Uh, in this hadith, ما دعوتني ورجوتني The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam spoke of dua or supplication. He spoke of raja, hope, and he spoke of al-istighfar. We've covered mainly al-istighfar and, um, and we have covered the, the, the issue of hope. Uh, I guess what remains here in, in, in the short time that we have left is the issue of ad-dua. Ad-dua or supplication. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam has told us that dua, dua is the essence of every ibadah, every act of worship. Okay? So we've talked about dua and dua, I mean it is known, it is when you are talking to Allah. You are begging of Allah for something. That Ya Allah grant me this, Ya Allah protect me from that. You ask Allah for certain things. But there is, I mean this is what we call dua al-mas'ala. Right? You're, you're requesting things, you're seeking protection, whatever. Then he says, الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ Now we're talking about worship in general. All of it is dua. How? I'm not asking, when I, there are certain things that I do. Okay? When I recite the Qur'an, am I asking anything of Allah Azza wa Do you see me asking? I'm reciting the Qur'an. When I give charity, am I now asking Allah? I'm, I'm giving from my wealth. When I assist somebody, I open the door for somebody. Remember when you do it for the sake of Allah, seeking uh, you know, reward, I mean, you're not saying anything, you're not requesting anything per se. But through your actions, actually you are requesting, are you not? Now why do we do these things? In the hope for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hoping that through these good deeds, Allah azza wa jal will protect us from punishment and will enter us into paradise. That He will give us rewards. So a dua in, in one narration, and, and the narration is not, uh, you know, the, the ulama spoke about, it says, مُخُّ ibada. It is the, the center of every, uh, of every act of worship. But the correct narration, الدُعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ Dua is ibadah. In other words, it is the essence of ibadah. 
it is uh, the, you know the, the driving force if you will behind uh, behind every ibadah now dua is an amazing weapon a weapon of of the believer we spoke about it previously but of course I remind myself and all of you on a regular basis because we know that everything rests in the hands of Allah nothing can happen without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for every single thing we need to turn to Allah we beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us faith even iman if it's not that Allah azza wa jal showers us with his mercy our iman will not increase and will not will not strengthen. We we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance for ourselves and for our children and, and, and our loved ones. We ask for everything. For success in our studies, in our work, etc. Everything. You have any issue, problems between you and your spouse, problems at work, whatever it may be, always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're ill. Um, you're, fa you're in the face of danger. I, mean, I don't have time, but I, you know, stories that have been written besides what we know from the Sahaba. Of course, we know many things from the Sahaba, but even after them, and even in recent times, where people who are ill and a dua, the dua either that they have made themselves, or someone close to them, or someone for whom they have done something has made for them, somebody supplicated for them, subhanAllah, as a result of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes miracles to happen, if you will. Somebody who was diagnosed with, you know, some sort of a disease, but with dua, Allah azza wa removed that disease. Yes, it happens. People, I mean, there are examples of, you know, people who were being chased by camels, and every time they would remember, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَى you know, remembering, I mean, they, they forget everything except, wow. And who is it that will help the one who is in distress when he turns to him? Always remember that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Ultimately, it is him and him alone. So, before we even start looking for other solutions, you see, this is why I say, if you're ill, I, don't understand from me that I'm saying just sit and make dua in the masjid all day long and don't bother seeing a doctor. We never said that. But before you think that the cure is going to come from the doctor, remember that it comes from Allah. Begin with dua and end with dua. Throughout your treatment, a dua, a dua. Because even that treatment will not be successful unless Allah wills it. So always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will never ever be disappointed. Allah Azza wa Jal, as the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam told us, is shy that when one of us raises his hands before him and begs of him, Allah Jalla is shy to return us empty handed. In other words, he will send blessings your way. He will send some good your way. And know and rest assured that when you supplicate to Allah, you will benefit. Even in that you will benefit undoubtedly. Either you will get what you are asking for, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will delay it for you, to, you know, you know and, to, to, and give you something even better in the hereafter, or instead of giving you what you asked for, you are not aware of something that is harmful that would have come your way, so Allah azza wa jal, because of your dua, averts that harmful thing from your way. In some way, shape or form, the dua is going to be accepted. Remember, Allah azza wa jal is listening and He hears all of our, all of our dua. There are certain times when we should be aware that dua is readily accepted. The Prophet alayhi salatu was was asked, and the hadith is found in uh, the Musnad of uh, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. He said, Ayyu ad-du'a'i asma' Which dua, I mean the, the, the meaning here is, which dua is most readily accepted? Okay? And the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said, Jawfu al-layl al-ghabir wa dubura as-salawat. Okay? In the dark part of the night, to the middle of the night, we're talking about, remember we talked about the last third of the night, when the dua is readily accepted. Allah azza wa jal, as we find in the hadith, stretches out his hand in the night. And he's asking the people, you and I, is there anyone who has a need so I can fulfill it for them? Is there anyone who wants to seek my forgiveness so I can forgive them? Is there anyone who is asking so I can respond 
to their requests, he's, Allah Azza wa is asking us every night. So he said, in that dark part of the night. And also he said, وَدُبُرْ salawat And at the end of every salah. So, here, at the end of the salah, you might think that, oh, then what is happening in our masjid is perfect. After the salah, we do a little bit of dhikr and the imam does dua and everybody together says ameen and we follow the sunnah. That is not what is meant by this hadith. Okay? Had it been that the Prophet ﷺ did this, of course we would have known it. But we know that the Prophet ﷺ, after the salah, would say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And perhaps before that, as in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, he said the takbir, Allahu Akbar, and then he said, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam, and all of these adhkar. So when is it that this dua should be said? We're talking about a dua that we want to be accepted. And I want also to, to, you know, to, to bring to, to everyone's attention that raising our hands in dua is the sunnah. Not all the time though. Raising the hands regularly for dua, yes, it is from the sunnah. But there are times that the Prophet ﷺ did dua by simply pointing towards the heavens. And there are times when he did not raise his hand at all when he did the dua. For example, when you're in tashahud, at tahiyyat, and then you say the salawat, and then you say dua. Are you raising your hands? You're not raising your hands, but you're still saying dua. When you're in your sujood, are you like this? No, you're in sujood, and your hands are, you know, facing the ground, and you are saying dua. So, it's not always that you raise your hands. As a matter of fact, it's not sunnah when the imam is delivering the khutbah on the day of Jumu'ah, and he's making dua that you raise your hands like many do. It's not from the sunnah. Of the Prophet alayhi as-salatu wasalam. So dubur as-salawat has two possible meanings. Dubur shay, yani akhiruhu or muakhiruhu, the end of it. So dubur as-salat could mean at the end of your salah, that is when you're in your tahiyyat. After a tahiyyat and a salawat al ibrahimiya then this is time for dua. I taught you one already, did I not? Uh, another one, Allahumma. أَعِنِّي عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ وَشُكْرِكَ وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ اللهم أَعِنِّي Oh Allah, help me عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ You know, help me so that I will be mindful of you, that I remember you on a regular basis. وَشُكْرِكَ Help me so that I will be grateful to you. And help me so that I can worship you well. وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ اللهم أَعِنِّي عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ وَشُكْرِكَ وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ This is yet another dua you can say in your tashahud before the salam. It is also understood that after the salah, after the salah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, when you say astaghfirullah, do you see people raising their hands? But it's a dua, isn't it? Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. But you're not raising your hands. This dua, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik, we also say after the salam. You can also say then, and you don't have to raise your hands, and you don't have to do it in unison, together. Another of the times for dua is when a person is in sujood. And perhaps this is something that many have forgotten, and it appears that way because many, if you watch them pray, and before the forehead can hit the ground, it's like they're already up. So I mean, leave alone subhanallah, huh? or subhana rabbi al-a'la, leave that, I mean, how could there have been a dua? So, Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la, after that, ask of Allah Azza wa Jal. Beg of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. This is the closest that anyone will be to Allah Azza wa Jal. That is when they are, uh, when they are in, their, in their sujood. Huh? Uh, between the Adhan and the Iqamah. This is the time also that the Prophet Alayhi Salatu told us that the dua is readily accepted. Uh, the last third of the night we have spoken of when it's raining. So, there are many, many times. Huh? If a person is ill, again, try to read these ahadith. You have uh, Riyadh al-Salihin, for example, in which uh, there are chapters that talk about dua and when the dua is accepted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the strength and the ability to go back and read these things so that we can apply them in our lives. If it's, if it's important to you, you will go look for it. Don't you want to know 
when the du'a will be most readily accepted. So we mentioned, uh, you know, a handful, barely a handful of things. There are many other times when the du'a is readily accepted. So let us go and learn those times, and then learn these these du'as. So this hadith is one that gives us hope, and we are in need of that because hope is what drives us. When everything is doom and gloom, then we give up hope. We give up working. But as long as we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for us, we will continue uh, to move and strive forward. The hadith again, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, Allah azza wa jalla said, Ya ibn Adam, inna kama da'awtani wa rawjawtani uh, illa ghafartu laka wa la ubali. Basically the meaning again, that oh, uh, oh children of Adam, as long as you continue to turn to me in supplication and keep hope in me, then I shall forgive you for whatever it is you may have done, and I will not mind. Even, O oh son of Adam, even if your sins reached the clouds of the skies, and you turn to me seeking my forgiveness, I shall forgive you, and I shall not mind. And he said, Ya ibn Adam, O oh children of Adam, that if you were to meet me, and we're talking about the day of Qiyamah, and your sins were so many that they would practically fill the entire earth. As long as you meet me and you have not associated any partners with me, then I will come to you similarly with forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep that hope alive in our hearts so that we will continue to strive and work towards Al-Jannah. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمُ لِسَائِرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ are there uh, any questions or, or comments? Thanks, hold on. What do you see for the Christian life? Um, have this idea that since we are Muslim, uh, if we die and then, for example, we go to Jahannam, it will not be forever. And we, we will still go to heaven after that. Right. So, what do you see for the Christian life? Right. So, there are those who may say that as long as I'm a Muslim and I die, well, ultimately, I'm going to go to paradise. You know, even if I get thrown into the hellfire, I mean, at the end, I'm still going to go to paradise. So that's, that's a kind of attitude some people may have. And of course, it is, uh, um, it is a dangerous attitude to have. Yes, you are Muslim today. Yes, you are Muslim today. But do you know about tomorrow? So if you leave your guard down, oh, I was, and, and usually people who speak in that way are those who have little understanding of, of the faith. So they think it is sufficient that I was born into a Muslim home and that, you know, I say la ilaha illallah, but obviously they are not ones who do much. Okay, so are you guaranteed that you will die even as a Muslim? You don't have that guarantee to begin with. Okay, the other thing is, let's say the person does some things, you know, let, let's say the bare minimum. Uh, we say to them that, Maybe give them some examples of, of worldly things, okay? And see if they react in the same way. We say to them, I mean, why bother working? Why bother working? I mean, you know that ultimately Allah is the provider, right? You're saying that ultimately you're going to go to heaven, so you don't mind being punished for a little while. So ultimately Allah is a provider and you happen to die of starvation because you know you couldn't uh, provide for yourself and it's okay, a little bit of suffering you know is okay. Are they actually going to accept that? I mean it's not logical and if you read what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have told us of the punishment in the hellfire then no one who is sane and no one with the slightest bit of understanding will say ah I don't really mind. I mean who amongst those who is sane will actually accept that, you know what, so I'll spend a few thousand years burning in hell. Like, you're going to be okay with that? Trust me, you're not going to be okay with that. It is uh, a torment that nobody can possibly imagine. And this is why we, we read those ahadith and how the skin will, you know, will bubble and uh, the people will wish for death but there is no death. People will actually wish for death at that time. So do you think now, and those are Muslims as well as non-Muslims. They're in the hellfire. Yes, Muslims will ultimately be removed from the hellfire, but do you want to be uh, held back at all? Leave alone those who will be in Jahannam or the hellfire. Ashabul A'raf. What about them? These are people who will be held on a certain plane between 
the hellfire and between Jannah, between paradise. So, they have not entered the hellfire. But they also have not entered paradise. For them, that is a form of punishment. For them, that is a form of punishment. Because they're seeing all these people enter paradise, and they desire and they wish to go. So they're feeling it. You know, this is in the hereafter. In, in this world, can you imagine? If you're sitting in a, in a hall, and the results are being called out uh, for certain exams, everybody's passed but you. Wow. How do you feel then? How is that person? I mean, they're, they're going to be okay with it? Obviously not. So, for these kind of people, we, we remind them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind them not to take things that lightly. Yes, a Muslim, a true Muslim is one who does fear the punishment of the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against it for a reason. That any sane person will not want to put himself or herself in that position. Allah ta'ala. <coughs> As far as what is happening in the world today, you know, things seem to be deteriorating, right? P the conditions are getting worse and then Muslims are being targeted more and even the scholars. Yes, we know that all of these are signs from the signs leading to the, to the hereafter. But it also does not mean that we just sit back and say, well, you know, what can we do? No, we have to keep doing our best to turn things around. And of course, we also have been, uh, we've we spoken previously about what will happen with Al-Mahdi and with the coming of Isa alayhi salam. Now, will things continue to deteriorate and they will never get better until the Mahdi comes? We say Allah Ta'ala A'lam, but uh, it does not appear that way. In other words, yes, things are getting bad, but inshallah Ta'ala, we will be, you know, in reality, many of us are not aware of the fact, the fact that Yes, although there are these, uh, you know, fit, this fitna, this trial that we're going through where Muslims are being persecuted left, right, and center, except that along with that is coming a revival. There is a revival. You see, for example, today in the Ummah, um, a lot who are turning back to Islam because we're seeing what's happening. And so, subhanAllah, uh, they're coming back to, to life. And so, yes, it's not all doom and gloom. We do see it in the Ummah. We do see more people praying today than maybe 10 or 15 years ago even. We do see that revival in the Ummah. So we shouldn't think that it's going to continue to get worse, period. No, inshallah ta'ala, things will get better. And however Allah Azza wa Jal wills for, for things to go, but then we have uh, even better glad tidings for when the Mahdi comes. Huh? But not to think that it will just go uh, as low as it possibly can before that. Wallahu a'lam. Um, the same question I asked in the class Last Thursday, one of the stars, I told my to stand the same thing. He gave us a very good answer. And he says, the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the time is also very, very difficult. Yeah. And that time, Allah was still there. So they the same arise there. Yeah. What we need to do is do our part. Yeah. I think that was a very good answer. Like exactly. That. So as we said earlier, with Qutuz and so on and so forth, why did the Muslims regain their honor and their strength? It's because they returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam, sister. Alaykum as-salam. Someone told me about this. You mentioned about people who intellect and they have to be deliberately committing rather major sins in your company. They could be friends or people that you know. What is your advice? Do you continue to keep the company I mean, uh, in today's situation, we tend to just look at what's happening. You may not be in a position to uh, correct the person. Uh, what do young, maybe this happened to a young person, or this, this other friend blatantly committed uh, quite a major sin in the company, in a group of people. Uh, what does a person, what does another person do in such a situation? Yeah. So, if you're in the company uh, of someone who blatantly commits 
uh, you know, a, a sin, and it may be a very major sin. We, as Muslims, our duty is to try and deter them. Now, everything is according to your ability and your means. If it is possible for us to put a stop to it, then it's an obligation for us to do so. Or to advise them, to speak to them, to try and, and reason with them, and to try and, and prevent them from doing that. Until the Prophet ﷺ says finally that, you know, but, but the least you can do is dislike it. To the, and, and the way that you will show that you dislike it is not just by sitting there. First of all, you don't show approval in any way, shape, or form. And it's happening, you try to deter whatever is, is, you know, is potentially going to happen. If, alhamdulillah, they stop, that is great. But otherwise, you remove yourself from that situation. Okay? Now, a big question here is, do I boycott that person and cut off ties with them entirely or not? Okay? Well, the answer is not necessarily as clear-cut as, as some may think. You don't say, no, you don't, you don't, you don't cut off ties at all. And you don't say um, that, yes, uh, you should necessarily cut off ties. It depends on the circumstances. Okay? Now, there are some people whom you may be very close with and they are not, you know, behaving the way that, that they should. It may be that by you giving them the cold shoulder, now you try to, to advise them and, you know, they're just not taking you seriously. But by you giving them the cold shoulder, meaning that you may start to distance yourself from them before, con uh, you know, cutting them off completely. If by you doing so, it will have an impact on that person. And you all know that there are cases, if you start uh, shying away from somebody because they have that relationship with you. They're worried. Like, how come? Why are you doing this? Uh, that, if it has that impact, by all means, start doing so. Start distancing yourself. So they will think, why? And they will actually ask you. Maybe not right away. Maybe after some time, they'll call you. They'll send you an email. Have I done anything? I'm really sorry. Oh, come on, all of us have been through that. They're asking you, come on, you know, there's something between us. What is it? Uh, then... There's benefit in it, so you do it. But there are those, it's not going to help at all. Okay? And by you remaining, keeping that contact, there is a hope that if not today, tomorrow, the next day, next year, there is some hope that you can reach them, even Allah Ta'ala. Okay? In that case, maintain ties with them. Why? Because there is a hope that you can slowly but surely get to them, inshaAllah. Then there are cases when if maintaining their company or by maintaining their company they're not going to improve because they simply don't listen to you they have a much stronger personality and there's a fear that they may start bringing you down and that happens a lot also in these cases just cut just you know cut ties completely make it a clean break and, and, and move on and, and they move on and, but do not doom them and condemn them pray for them you're doing this to save yourself. But at the same time, you want good for them. I gain nothing by wishing ill on them. But I gain everything by wishing good for them. Alright? So, sometimes you do cut off. Make it a clean break, but pray for them. And, you know, let them know that you, you still wish every, every good for them. Because if, if quote-unquote, religious people start condemning others, what are they going to say? Oh, look at that holier-than-thou attitude. What, you think that you're better than me now? <laughs> uh, that's the attitude but if you show that attitude then they, they rightfully say that so we also don't want to want to create so there has to be that balance and there has to be a great deal of wisdom Allah Ta'ala Ta'ala yeah. um, uh, there's a reference to the accomplishment that you're doing that Allah you know, will give us uh, until as high as the sky how about um, uh, shirk no. shirk in, uh, in the Quran and the Hadith Yes. In Allah, لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. So the ayah, the meaning of the ayah is that indeed Allah will not forgive. In Allah, لا يغفر أن يشرك به. Will not forgive that he be uh, or, or, or that somebody or something else is wor is worshipped alongside him. That shirk is committed against him. In Allah, لا يغفر أن يشرك به. So he will not forgive that others are worshipped besides him. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ And he forgives everything besides that. How do we understand this? Okay? We understand it in this way. If a person dies, 
a person dies and they died upon shirk they died upon shirk they did not repent from shirk an example a person dies as a Buddhist a person dies as a Christian a person dies as a Jew a person dies on any faith other than Al-Islam they did not repent okay the general ruling no matter what good they may have done in their lives Allah will never forgive them for that shirk and they are doomed to the hellfire and they will never be removed from the hellfire. Forever they will remain in the hellfire. Whatever rewards they may have deserved for the good that they did, they already received them in this world. Okay? Now, second thing is, and why do we say that? Because shirk happens in the world every day, every second. Today there are many who are committing shirk, but before they die they will become Muslim. Right? So the ayah couldn't mean that if somebody committed shirk once in their life, then they are doomed to the hellfire forever. If that was the case, then what about the Sahaba? Were well, not many of the Sahaba first idol worshippers? They worshipped idols. And then when the Prophet ﷺ came and he called them to Islam, their Islam, their coming to Islam was their tawbah, their repentance from shirk. So they left shirk and they accepted Islam. So the shirk in a person's lifetime, if they committed shirk and they repent for it, it will be forgiven. Is that clear? In the lifetime. But if a person dies upon shirk, this is what is not forgiven. Does that make it clear now? So, otherwise, there would be a big problem with the Sahaba. How many of the Sahaba used to be on shirk and they became Muslim? So, are we going to say that's an unforgivable uh, crime? No. It is forgivable if a person repents from it in this world. And this is why. We find people today uh, who out of ignorance or wrong uh, understanding and so on and so forth from amongst the Muslims commit shirk. And there is minor shirk, there is major shirk, but there are those who will actually at times of need call upon other than Allah. It's our duty to warn them because this is you know, leading them towards ultimate destruction. So we need to warn them because this is a major sin and it's an unforgivable sin. So we don't want them to die upon that. Allah wa Allah. There's a, an expression that is used by the Arabs, Al Khayru fi Allah. The good is in that what Allah chooses for us. Hmm? So I guess the brother is asking, does that refer to when you know you make a decision and then some good comes from it? Or is it only when you know you, you, you had no idea and it just something comes your way, so it's good for you? I think it, it's much broader than that. Meaning this. Um, you know, we also look at the ayat of the Quran such as وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So we are told by Allah Azza wa Jal, the meaning of this is, that it may be you dislike something, yet it is, yet it is good for you. Huh? And it may be that you, dis, uh, you like something, and yet it is not good for you. But Allah knows, and, and you do not, and you do not know. This is how it goes. In our lives, we have decisions to make. Right? We are faced with decisions day in and day out. We have to make every effort to base our decisions on that which is pleasing to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? We uh, have something in front of us, okay, we will decide what is halal over what is haram, for example. All right? So when we make those decisions, let's say you make a decision, why? Because you know it's the right thing to do. But by making that decision, the consequences don't seem very good. You know, because you chose to do something which you believe is right, other people look down upon you. Because you made that decision, you lost your job because of, right? But know at the end that this was Allah's choice for you and it is best for you. And it is best for you. عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ So the Prophet ﷺ also told us that how amazing is the affair of the believer. Everything for the believer is good. Without exception. 
But that is only for the believer. And then he continued and he told us if some calamity befalls that individual, then he or she is patient, practices self-restraint, and so it is better for them. And if some good comes their way, then they are grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal, and that is, and that is better for them. And that is good for them. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, in the end, remember, whatever happens, whether it appears to be good or it appears to be bad, after it happens, that was the choice of Allah for you. And so, accept it. And know that as long as Allah chose that to happen for you, then ultimately there is good behind it for you. Because maybe one, uh, an individual even committed a sin. Right? It could be. After that, as a result of it, subhanAllah, the person felt such remorse and turned to Allah, they become closer to Allah than they were before that sin. Is that not better for them? This is what Allah Azza wa Jal had willed for that individual. Okay? Uh, and I guess another way you can look, uh, look at it is, make your decisions based on that which is pleasing to Allah, because that is what Allah has chosen for you. So whatever that decision you make, because it is in accordance with what Allah has chosen for you, then there's nothing but good in it. خَيْرُ فِي مَا اِخْتَارَهُ اللَّهِ So this is Allah's choice for you, to do the halal over the haram. Do the right thing, according to the teachings of Islam, and it will always be good for you. Wallahu a'ala. Sorry to ask the question. Yeah, it's clear for us in Islam is mandatory. No. Then you hear sometimes from your own Muslim brothers and sisters, come on, they have total denial. Say, I'm a good human being, I don't have to pray. Then you hear other clauses saying that prayer is only a tradition in Islam. These are the words from Muslims. What do you think of that? That is, um, that is pathetic. That we hear from amongst the Muslims, those who are saying that, you know, prayers is it's only a tradition. And, you know, I'm a good person. And people who speak that way, they are the ones with the blackest of hearts. Be, you know, rest assured. Not that there's no chance for them, but obviously as long as they're speaking that way, then you know that they have a huge problem. So the Prophet ﷺ warned us of similar things. He says, you're going to follow in the footsteps of those who came before you. And he's referring here to the Christians and the Jews. And he talks about how, you know, inch by inch, foot by foot, to the extent that if they were to crawl into a lizard's hole, you would follow behind them. Now, I use this example, why? Because today, you hear from, uh, you know, for certain from the Christians, you know, just love Jesus. Accept Him in your heart and everything else will be okay. Look at this is exactly how some of the Muslims became. Salah, not so important. Siyam, not, I'm a good person. You know, I accept Allah. That's it. I said, La ilaha illallah, I'm guaranteed to be a Muslim and I'm going to enter paradise. Of course, the action, I'm not saying the person because we, we can't judge a person until we've, we, we, we've dealt with them one on one. But those words are words of disbelief, words of kufr. Okay, to believe that salah is merely a tradition is kufr. It is one of those things of the ruriyat, one of the necessities of the religion. As a matter of fact, it is one of the foundations upon which this religion has been built. Buni al Islam wa ala khams. Islam is built upon five things. And as salah, is the second of them after the shahada is the salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not only encourage us in the Quran to, to, to establish the prayer, but He orders and He commands us to do so. So the salah is an integral part of Islam. Uh, there's no such thing as, a, as salah is only a tradition. The person says that I'm a good person. They may, they may have some good attributes, but there are non-Muslims who have good attributes as well. There are some non-Muslims who are, you know, quite uh, honest and so on and so forth. Um, okay, but that's, that's not sufficient. You have to go far beyond that. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Okay, there's another class beginning soon, so we will need to vacate the space. Hala wallahu alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi.